Hello, everybody. Thanks to all of you being present in this classroom at 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. So we welcome you to the first seminar of the biology seminar series in spring 2024. And this is this first seminar is an unusual initiative, a collaborative initiative involving nursing, psychology, responsible sexuality. And um, I am going to thank a few people who have made this happen. Number one, Dr. Betsy Dams. Without them, this event would not have happened as they connected me to Rosa, Christina, and our speaker, Nelly. Okay. So I'm just going to briefly mention the division of labor. So Rosa will be, Rosella, sorry, uh, will be introducing the speaker, Christina Jordan, who is a professor, assistant professor of nursing, and Rosella. Travassa is an assistant professor of psychology. I forgot to mention that. So Christina would be taking uh, care of you know, the QA, Q&A session. And um, me, myself, I will look at the Zoom chat box and take care of any possible technical issues that might happen. So having said so, you know, Megan, we are very grateful that you could make it. And we look forward to what you have to say. And thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dean, for that uh, for introducing me today's discussion. I'm very glad to um, just give you a brief presentation of our guest today. Uh, that would be very glad to uh, bring here at the Silver's George and also to keep together faculty and students from different programs and department today. So, Dr. Megan Massa joined Emory uh, Neuroscience Biobehavioral Biology Department as an assistant teaching professor in the fall of 2023. Most of their academic journey has focused on the study of neuroendocrinology, and they are particularly interested in the effects of estrogens and androgens, for instance, estradiol and testosterone, respectively, on behavior and disease. As an undergraduate, Dr. Massa investigated a rapid non-genomic track with testosterone on goldfish mating behavior. Following graduation, she conducted research on the differential effects of androgen treatment on inflammation and neurodegeneration in a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, while on a Fulbright study research grant to Germany. Dr. Massa then transitioned to estrogens for their graduate work, studying how metabolic and reproductive cues from the ovaries integrate to alter feeding behavior. In addition to this, Dr. Massa engages queer and feminist theories alongside scholarship from science and technology studies to interrogate how social framework contribute to neuroscientific study of sex physiologies. So thank you once again, uh, Megan, for joining us today. And please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Megan Massa today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm mm -hmm. gonna remove my mask because I couldn't get captions up on the screen, um, but I'll kind of try and stay in this area by my little HEPA filter. Um, so the first thing I would like to say is thank you all for coming today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Mo, you did my job for me, which is by thanking everybody, but I'd like to particularly thank Rosella for inviting me here today, um, and I'm excited to talk to you all about deconstructing sex. Um, so just a little overview of what we are going to be talking about today. Um, so the first thing I kind of wanted to set the stage of why it might be important for us to engage in this activity of deconstructing sex at the lab bench. Um, I then want to kind of talk about a little bit of the history of what other people have put forward to kind of combat the, um, shall we say, problems that I will try and illuminate for you today um, before I try and convince you that there's a missing link that all of these things have in common, and that is that all of the proposed solutions so far consider sex a tangible, real category that we should continue to be using. Um, so hopefully I get you to try and start thinking about maybe maybe we should deconstruct sex a little bit, or maybe I even convince you that would be the better part. 
Um, then the last thing I'll kind of do is give you two of my favorite ways from uh, a paper that I published with a couple of colleagues about how we can deconstruct sex um, at the lab bench. So, am I not here? There we go. Why should we deconstruct sex? So I'm going to present two different ways of thinking about why there are problems with using the category of sex. Um, I'm going to start with policy and discrimination. And I want to point out for any of the biologists in the room that I am purposely framing this in a political context because I would like to push back against the idea that science is inherently objective and that there is no interplay between science and society. Um, so unfortunately, uh, 2023 was a really bad year for anti-trans legislation. Um, you can kind of see that over oh, about 600 bills were introduced and about <laughs> a, little, a little under 100 were passed, restricting trans medical care, movement, sports involvement, things of that nature. And even though we're only half a month into 2024, um, we still see that the trans legislation tracker is tracking almost 300 bills in the United States at both the federal and the um, state level. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense, I think a little under 100, according to the <laughs> website, are actually new bills this year. The rest are rollover. Now, the reason I wanted to start with this is because these bills appeal to the authority of science when they are trying to perpetuate um, their anti-trans and anti-intersex um, agendas. So what I did as a little exercise for us today is I looked at all of the federal bills from last year that came before either the House or the Senate, and I looked at how they decided to define sex. Um, and these were specifically only, I only paid attention to bills that were restricting um, medical care for trans youth or trans adults, uh, sports involvement, um, and I think I also did restriction of movement for like bathroom bills, okay? And one thing that's really clear about these 12 bills that I have narrowed it down to is that they all um, they all have the same notes, okay? And I made this great little word cloud for us, um, which is how they define sex. The um, size of the font is proportional, I think I did it properly, um, to the number of times it showed up in each of these bills. Um, and if anything is bold, it was in every bill, okay? So this is how our government tends to define sex. The term, quote, biological sex, means that biological indicators or indications of male or female in the context of natural reproductive role, potential, or capacity, such as through genes or sex chromosomes, naturally occurring sex hormones and gonads, and non-ambiguous internal and external genitalia present at birth. Um, about half of the bills also included some form of this little sentence down here, which was differentiating biological sex and saying it was without regard to or does not include an individual psychological chosen or subjective experience of gender. So there are a couple of things I kind of wanted to point out here that these legislators are doing. They're appealing to the authority of science by specifically saying biological sex, making it one term, putting it in scare quotes together. They're upholding a binary of male or female, and we are specifically talking about classifying male or female by reproductive potential. Um, I, as a neuroendocrinologist, was actually a little offended that gonads and sex hormones weren't in every bill, um, but they were in most of them. But we are mostly, we're talking about sex chromosomes and internal and external genitalia. I also took the liberty of looking at some important bills for our state of Georgia. So the first one I want to point out is the current active bill in the state of Georgia, which is House Bill 3836. Okay, which has a slightly different definition of sex, but it still has the same themes where we have male or female, so we have this binary, <laughs> a focus on genetics and physiologies, and we actually have an indirect um, reference to external genitalia by looking at sex as identified on the original birth certificate, right, which is generally how sex is assigned um, on birth certificates. I'd also like to point out that these bills, as well as this one, particularly when they are um, restricting care for trans youth um, often have this exception. Okay, so this is the bill that was passed last year by the Senate of Georgia and by, it is law in Georgia, Senate Bill 140, um, where we have these limited exception, exceptions um, where we can perform surgeries and surgical treatment and other forms of what they would consider trans treatment if that treatment is medically necessary. We do a whole talk on what medically necessary means and who gets to decide. Um, but we're not going to do that today. Instead, I want to point out 
down here, uh, 65 to 67, treatments for individuals born with a medically verifiable disorder of sex development. They're here referring to intersex infants, um, including individuals born with ambiguous genitalia or chromosomal abnormalities, <coughs> excuse me, resulting in ambiguity during the individuals, regarding the individual's biological sex, right? So the point here is we have this problem, or some may think it's a problem, some may not, um, where we have a limited of uh, uh, limited um, limitation of trans and intersex rights to uphold this binary of, of male or female, okay? And they're using biological language and biological terminology in order to help do so. So let's switch gears a little bit as we race through this and talk about some of the things, the problems that we see in science and medicine that I think are also derivative on this two sex model. So in 2000, uh, not 2000, ooh, 1993, um, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, saw that we had a problem in clinical research. And that problem was that we were excluding women and other minorities. And they came up in the mid 1990s. They came up in the mid-1990s with um, two separate initiatives, um, a women's inclusion in, in clinical studies initiative, and uh, I think they call it like diversity and racial and ethnic minorities initiative, right? Um, and since then, the good news is, is that at least in terms of gender, we have both parity of males and females, men and women, as defined by the NIH, in clinical trials. But that hasn't stopped other problems from occurring. So what I have here is a, a little graphic from nature <laughs> where we have the burden of diseases in the US. Um, and I think this is mostly the US. Um, so what you can see, and I'm sorry, the, the resolution kind of got chewed up a little bit. But what you can see here is the uh, area of the circle is the relative medical and um, financial burden of a certain disease. If the circle is larger, it's a higher burden. Um, and if the circle is colored blue, it is it has more of a quote unquote male bias or a higher burden on men. And if it is a, a red circle, it has quote unquote female bias or a higher burden on women, okay? And so these are the burden of the diseases, but when you look at the NIH funding of these things, what we notice is that thankfully, at least the three biggest circles are still in the top five, right? But what we also notice is that there is a disproportionate amount of women-focused diseases that are down here, right? And what this is because is what I would argue this is because it's the devaluation of things associated with womanhood and femininity, right? These things are special interests. We don't need to fund them as much. Um, so this is the start of an introduction to the androcentric bias in science. We actually see the same thing in basic biomedical research. So in 2011, uh, Annalise Ferry and Herb Zucker produced this um, kind of round shaping um, publication where they looked at a bunch of different um, fields in the sciences and looked in their basic biology and basic things. Like we're not talking about humans anymore, we're talking about animals and looked at a couple of top journals and looked at how many animals of each sex were included in each of these uh, studies. And what they found, so here what you can see is the, you know, this is not exhaustive, okay? But they have a couple of different um, fields on the bottom here, and you can just kind of ignore the y-axis. But what you're looking at is that if the bar is higher in blue, there is just a lot of studies only looking at males. Red is the study only looking at females, purple is bold, and gray is where that they didn't say, unspecified. Um, and so what I hope you can appreciate here, and what a lot of people started freaking out about actually, rightfully so, is that except for things like reproduction, behavior, zoology, things that you know usually consider sex, um, everybody else was mostly either studying males or it was unspecified. And so almost in direct response to this, the NIH created something known as SABV, or sex as a biological variable. Um, it was implemented in 2016, and now all researchers submitting grants to the NIH needed to consider sex in their proposal or give, you know, what I call like a damn good reason as to why they shouldn't. So for instance, if you can't determine the sex of something you're studying, or if, um, say, you're studying testicular cancer, you only should study things that have testicles, right? Um, now, the problem is that in a 10-year follow-up study from this one, so we have SABD kind of thrown in there, and Annalise Ferry, and now a couple of new friends come together, do the same study um, in 2019 is what they were assessing, um, but this article came out in 2021, 
Um, and the long and the short of it is highlighted here is that they found that the majority of studies failed to provide the rationale for single sex studies or the lack of sex based analyses. And those that did relied on misconceptions surrounding the hormonal variability of females. So this, this last part, this hormonal variability of females um, is something that has been a problem for a while, right? So we have this devaluation of, of, of things associated with womanhood, but then we also have this, this um, idea that women are hormonal and therefore more variable, and that gets transposed onto animals. So Becca Shansky wrote this great article, I had, it's pretty snarky, I highly recommend you read it, Are Hormones a Female Problem in Animal Research, and discuss this very problem. Whenever someone is asked to include females, they automatically think, oh, now I have to look at hormones, despite the fact that everybody has hormones, okay? Every animal, um, every mammal, I should say, at least, has hormones. Um, and this is also an actual statistical fallacy. So this is uh, in 2014 and 2016, right? So even before SABD came out, we have female mice liberated for inclusion in neuroscience and biomedical research and, man, and female rats are not more variable than male rats, right? We actually have the data to back this up, but the, the misconception still persists. And even when the misconception doesn't persist, even when people are like, okay, let's do SABD, let's look males and females, there is an over-reliance on sex differences. Right, so uh, Donna Maney out at uh, Emory University um, has this great, just like a circus, right? We as a society really love sex differences, gender differences, right? You know, you hear like girls learn uh, language faster and men, boys learn math faster and we need, to, we need to teach them differently in order to keep them at parity, right? We love it, the media loves it, right? And because we love it, we actually end up in science with misreporting of sex differences. Um, so one of my friends, and actually shout out, um, they're my TA um, for my class this year, Yesenia, that's the support of this. Um, he and Donna um, actually looked at the same papers from this study and looked at, okay, in the, in the papers that did look at sex differences, um, did they do it right? And the answer was on the large part, no. Right, the people would say there were sex differences where the statistics didn't back it up, um, and so on and so forth. Right, so we have these two problems. Right, we have the public problem of um, discriminatory legislation, and we have this androcentric bias in science that spans both basic research all the way to clinical research. So I'm not the only person in this field, and I'd like to take a little minute to to give others their flowers and, and talk about the shoulders of the giants that I'm standing upon today. So there are a couple of different options that people have put forth to help contradict these problems and help solve these problems. One of the most famous people is Anne Foster Sterling. Um, and I like to call the, the thing that Anne has proposed, um, starting with the book um, Sexing the Body in 2000, as sex as multiple variables. Um, and I think that Anne's work with Daphne Jewel also kind of uh, brings this out a lot. Um, and basically what they're saying and what Anne has said for a very long time is that sex is a composite category, right? We have hormones and chromosomes and internal and external genitalia and secondary sex characteristics and body composition, all of these things that we put in sex. And so we should actually just treat it like a category that has lots of things in it. And what Daphna kind of um, shows in, in her work on the mosaic brain is that, um, you know, even if you can look at everything in a box and accurately predict, okay, Given what's in this box, this person is female, can't go the other way around, right? You can't say this person is female, now I can tell what's in the box, okay? So just to wrap that up, right? Sex is a heterogeneous category and should be treated as such. <clears throat> so working off of this, Stacey Ritz comes in and does what I call sex as a starting point. So Stacey is a um, cell researcher, a, a cell culture researcher. And, and Stacey has published a couple, uh, a little bit on uh, the idea that sex differences is not a mechanism, right? Um, this is also brought up if you've read any of um, some of Cordelia Klein's early work, not, not this work. Um, so um, here, what, what we're talking about is the idea that um, if you see a, a sex or gender difference in an animal in, in humans, and then you find a sex or gender difference in the brain, that's kind of a tautological argument, right? A sex difference causes a sex difference, and that's not a mechanism, right? And so Stacy says, okay, Let's start with the sex difference, and then you have to drill down. It can't be the end point, right? 
Um, and to give a little bit more flowers to Stacey, um, she also pushes back a little bit how this is also a problematic, it's not a perfect solution, because looking at sex differences can also obscure variability within sex. And also there are still some things like cell culture, where the sex of something isn't like obviously apparent because there's like 20 X chromosomes and two and a half Y because of how we passage things. Um, okay, so that's Stacey Ritz's. Sex category can be used to start an investigation, but once sex differences are found, we have to treat it as a composite category, like the previous folks have said. So then also recent, and then the next one that I wanna highlight is Sarah Richardson's idea of sex contextualism. So sex contextualism, this uh, came out in uh, 2021, I believe, is the idea that sex changes over time and environment, okay? And so it, it becomes dynamic. We have, this is where we have a little bit of that queer theory coming in, right? The, dynamis, the dynamicness, all right? Um, and so we should always define sex differently for different studies. We should write how we're defining it and we should define it by the context. So here's an example from um, the paper, the sex contextualist paper. So we know, for instance, that estradiol impacts trauma and shock and sepsis in the brain. So, so as an example, Sarah Richardson says, okay, maybe we have four sexes in this case. We have premenopausal women who are in the stage of high estradiol, premenopausal women in the stage of low estradiol, postmenopausal women, and, and men. Um, and you might see why I might think that this might be a problem here. Um, but the point being, right? Sex is a dynamic category, which I think is, is what holds true from sex contextualism that changes with environment and time. Um, these sexes used in a study should reflect that. And because of the contextual and dynamic nature of sex, we have to move away from deterministic um, interpretations of these studies. Uh, the last uh, kind of framework I wanna highlight is the human uh, gender sex entanglement, which has been more re most recently pushed uh, by Sari Van Anders. Um, now, Sari has done a lot of work in humans, predominantly um, looking at how gendered experiences change sex variables and physiologies. So the idea that gender does not necessarily spring from sex, right, that instead they mutually inform each other, um, and that the sex-related variables like hormones are not natural and innate because of their gender, but instead gender exposures and behaviors can impact these variables, right? We know that gendered experiences can actually change testosterone levels, for instance, right? And that's, that's a lot of Sari's work. Okay, a long introduction, um, but let's talk about, let's just like wrap this up. So we have three problems. We have discriminatory trans and intersex legislation. We have androcentric bias in science and funding, and we have a fixation and over-exaggeration on these innate biological differences. Then we have these four solutions I presented to you. There are definitely more. But these are the ones I've chosen. Sex as multiple variables, human gender sex entanglement, sex contextualism, and sex as a starting point. Now we can ask the question of what connects all these problems and why haven't these frameworks fixed them? And one might be, one very good reason might be that there's not a lot of like buy-in right now for all of these things. But I would like to argue that actually the answer to these two questions are the same. And that's that it, embedded in all of these is the implicit validation of a hierarchical two-sex Right, thinking back to Sarah Richardson's work where we had all these different kinds of women and then men, right? That it kind of is embedded in these systems. And so for lack of a better, uh, well, not even lack, like to, to give uh, homage to another great thinker, as Audrey Lord says, master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, right? And so this is kind of where um, I want to be us to be headed in deconstructing sex. So so let me let me give you a little bit of why I think, how I think all these problems come from this implicit idea of a two-sex system. So if you were to ask maybe any typical undergraduate who doesn't usually think about these topics, right? Like who's just like kind of absorbed things through osmosis, you will and you ask them about sex and gender, you might get kind of two different ideas from them. They'll say that sex and gender are different from each other. They'll say probably that there are two sexes that are different from each other. And they'll probably say, which is kind of popular these days, is that gender is a social experience based on sex, right? So people think about, for instance, gender socialization a lot of the time as, oh, I see you, you look like this sex, I'm gonna treat you different, right? Or some people even think about gender identification as like how I feel versus what my body looks like. Though those things, those are not necessarily how we in this room might think of them. Those are definitely conceptions that we have in society, right? So these two things, 
try to mutually reinforce each other. And actually, before I go on, I'd like to give a little shout out um, to a book called um, Making, uh, yeah, Making Sex by Thomas Lacker, um, who kind of talks a little bit more about how um, he proposes the hypothesis, basically, that the two sex theory came about to support our gendered systems and our gendered social hierarchy. Um, but you don't have to believe that in order to, to, to follow the logic I'm trying to bring out for you here. Okay, so you have these two sexes that are inherently different, and gender is a social experience and internal identification of sex. Um, in Western society, we tend to, or we have two different things that are diametrically opposed, we tend to create hierarchical relationships between them. And when we do that, we get the first problem which is the androcentric bias in science through the universalization and worthiness of superior, or in this case, male experiences, and the downplaying or unworthiness of inferior, in this case, female experience, right? We have that if it happens in males, it will apply to everyone. And then, oh, we also shouldn't look at, but we shouldn't look at females because they're unwieldy and, and, and very, very, right? So let's go back here to the two sexes are inherently different. Um, if the two sexes are inherently different, the next logical step is that we need to over-exaggerate. We tend to over-exaggerate sex differences, right? And I call this dimorphizing, taking something that's overlapping and making it unoverlapping. And if we're doing that, we also create non-overlapping categories, right? And everything within them. So if we've assigned these physiologies female and these physiologies male. We've now created them as non-overlapping. And if we've created them as non-overlapping, that means that anything that traverses that and it is deviation or aligns to these two categories is now viewed as abnormal. And here's how we get um, regulation of the intersex difference. We can then even go back to this deviations or elisions between that which is abnormal, bring it together with the idea that two sexes are inherently different and that gender is the experience of two sexes and get that sex refuting genders are illegitimate and pathologized. This is anti-trans legislation, okay? We can then go back a little bit further to this non-overlapping, oh wait, nope, I'm gonna take it. We're going to, I forget which order I have them pop up. Um, we have here, let's go back here, this idea that gender is the socialized experience and internal identifications of sex. Let's marry that with the non-overlapping categories of sex. If we have two sexes with non-overlapping categories and they map onto gender, now all of a sudden, sex physiologies can explain gender. And then this leads to sex and sex related variables becoming gender. Estrogen is female. Testosterone is male. Um, testosterone makes you masculine and aggressive, things of that nature. Okay. And this green box is one that we're going to dive a little bit deeper into. Um, let's go back again to this non overlapping categories, and all contained within it are also non overlapping. One of the things that it does to science, right? One of the, the next logical steps that we have two categories, male and female, everything in them is non overlapping. That leads to this idea of what I call assumed internal consistency, meaning that if I know someone is female, I can, I know everything in the box. But not only that, is if I know one thing in the box, I can assume everything else in the box. If I know you have XX chromosomes, I can assume you have this level of estradiol and this level of X and Y and Z and so on and so forth. And this assumed internal consistency is what leads to a big problem in science, which is underspecified data and imprecise science. And like I said, these two things are the things that I would like to kind of go into today a little bit deeper. I also did forget to mention, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. I know I'm a fast talker, I'm working on it, um, but I am from Jersey, so. Um, so here we have these two things, underspecified science, underspecified data, and a gendering of our science, of our variables in science. So in the paper that I published with a couple of colleagues um, back in I don't know, October, maybe, I don't remember, I'm not good with dates, also called Deconstructing Sex, um, we presented a little seven, seven little um, guidance questions for biologists and neuroendocrinologists to help deconstruct sex at the lab bench. I'm going to focus on these two today because they correlate to what I just told you about. So the idea of going from sex to sex variables is an attempt to um, re-specify data sets um, and ungendering and recontextualizing is uh, an attempt to de-gender de our physiologies. So um, let's start with from sex to sex variables. And um, you're gonna forgive me now, 
Um, so I was told this was a biology seminar, so I did include some biology in it. I will do my best to make it applicable to everybody, um, but please stop me. I'd like to give you an anecdote of, of why this is so important from my own experience as a lab technician. Um, so as uh, Rosella told us in the beginning, uh, in my introduction, um, when I was at UCLA, I worked at, in a uh, rodent model looking at the effects of estrogens on feeding behavior, feeding behavior, okay? This is a little graphical abstract of what we found, so spoiler alert. Um, if you would like to see the paper, that's also out in my science. Um, so the general gist is that in mice that were not fat, that were skinny, there was, uh, we looked in the cells of a brain region known as the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus, for those non sciencey among us, if you were to do the disgusting thing and put your finger to the back of your throat and then put it up, push up into your brain, you'd hit your pituitary and then you'd hit your hypothalamus. So it's like right in the center of your brain, okay? Very ancient structure. Um, my introduction to neuroscience textbook told me that the hypothalamus is involved in homeostasis which is the regulation of different processes in the body. And it's responsible for the four Fs, uh, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and sex. And yes, that was that, those were the words in my textbook. Um, so good job right, uh, putting that joke in there. Anyway, so, so we looked in this hypothalamus, we looked in animals that were skinny, and we saw that in non-fat animals, when there was high levels of estradiol, the cells in this region made the animals eat. Okay, but in a different context, shout out Sarah Richardson, when the animals were fat, had high fat content, um, and oh, still ovarian hormones like estradiol were high, now these cells stopped feeding. Okay, and if uh, there are biologists who would like the data, here is one of the many data that we have to um, explain this. So I'll just go through this very quickly. So we have here, um, starting body weight on the x-axis, and um, this is not fat, but it correlates with fat. So I promise you we have other information to prove that it's fat, but this is just the easiest thing to show right now. And then on the y-axis, we have food intake. So how much these animals are eating at night, which is when mice are awake. So I think I will use, I'm sorry for the people on Zoom, but um, I will use uh, this here for now. So we let's just start looking at the black lines here. So the one on top, is when the um, animals have a high estradiol level, and the ones on the bottom are the animals that have a lower estradiol level, okay? So if we look at this black line, what I want you to notice is that, thank you. Perfect, I feel so old school. Um, so what I want you to notice is that um, as body weight and also adiposity increases, feeding decreases, right? So we have uh, the heavier animals eat less, and the lighter animals eat more. But when we look at the black line here with low estradiol, that isn't happening, right? So the general gist is that our area of interest listens to body weight when estradiol is high, but not when it's low. Um, the little blue line is just us showing that it's, it's our area of interest that's doing this. We, we deleted the neurons and we showed that the relationship. Okay, the point being, our area of interest listens to body weight when estradiol is high, but not when it is low, okay? So one of the questions I had when I was working in the lab was does this estradiol dependent process occur in humans? I'm gonna highlight that I'm interested specifically in estradiol. That is the variable. So how did we decide to do this? We uh, hooked up with a, one of my uh, friends and colleagues at the University of California, Irvine, Martha Selden, who uses something known as the GTEx portal. The GTEx portal is a database of post-mortem human tissue where after people die, they donate their body to science, and then we look at what genes are turned on in these tissues. And what Marcus has developed us to be able to do is use gene expression co-correlations as a proxy for tissue crosstalk. What the hell does that mean? So what we can do is we can say, okay, we're interested in what the brain is talking to, what other tissues the brain is talking to. So we can put in, in our input, these are the genes in the brain we're interested in. And we can then look at other tissues around the body. In our case, they were metabolic tissues. 
and say, okay, when these genes are turned on, are these other genes also always turned on? Do they go on and off together at different parts of the body? Or they could do opposite, like when these are on, these are always off and vice versa, right? So if they're correlated across the large distance of the body, basically what we're kind of saying is like, they must be talking to each other, right? That can't be, that can't just be a fluke, okay? And so what we ended up doing um, is I ended up um, making the cells of interest glow, the cells that we are interested in glow red, and then use the fact that they're glowing red to isolate them. So I just have our cells of interest from the brain. They're all nice and red. Um, and then we send them off to see what genes are turned on. And that becomes our input. So we say, okay, the cells of interest we're interested in, we put them in the brain and we say, now, which, which things are we talking to? What did we expect? We expect to see that when estradiol is high, it's listening to fat, but when estradiol is low, it's not listening to fat anymore. Okay? So we need two groups. We need two groups. We need a high estradiol group and a low estradiol group. If we're going to detect anything meaningful, we must divide our humans into low and high estradiol groups. Could we do that with a GTX database? Well, this is all we knew about the humans, okay? We knew their sex. And I asked Marcus, as he played around in this database, how are they defining sex, right? Is it medical record? What are they doing? It's actually Y chromosome presence, okay? So that means that in, in males, we could have XY, we could have XYY, we don't really know, which is if they have a Y chromosome in females, we could have XX, XO, right? We could have trans folks mixed in here, we could have intersex folks mixed in here, we could have a bunch of people mixed in. We also know their age of death and when these were collected. We also knew how they died, that was really helpful, right? And so most people would say, okay, we're looking at high and low estradiol groups, um, let's use we could do a couple things. We could use females as a proxy. We can say males have low estradiol, females have high estradiol, let's compare that, okay? We could also, some people might be a little smarter and be like, oh, look at this. We have two thirds at least of our folks that are above the age of 50. Now, if you remember that typically menopause happens at around age 50, maybe instead let's actually just look in the females and do like the young versus old. Maybe, maybe that's the way to do it, right? But I'm going to argue that using females as a proxy assumes this internal consistency that I talked about earlier and ignores the existence of trans people, intersex people. What if someone over 50 is on hormone replacement, right? Like my mother's been on hormone replacement for like 10 years at this point, right? Um, that's going to screw up the results, right? We would be missing valuable information and we would have inappropriate interpretations. Um, so not afraid of a challenge. I'm always like, okay, what do we know? The other thing that we have is we have genes. That is what this database says. We have all these genes and all these tissues. We know what these people have turned on, okay? So I developed a way that used our knowledge of the fact that estrogen turns on genes to take advantage of maybe if we looked at what genes were turned on across tissues in all these people, we could see who has estrogen doing work in the body, okay? So, um, the complicated way that we did this was I used a set of known estrogen responsive genes. And for the biologists, that was the early response estrogen gene from a GSEA data set. Um, we then normalized their expression across tissue. This is important, regardless of assigned sex. Didn't matter whether you had a Y chromosome or not. We just looked at was estrogen doing work in your body as defined by these genes being turned on. Um, and then we used Fancy, well, I didn't, this, this part was mine, so I'm not that good. Um, he used mathematical models to segregate people into low and high estradiol groups. Just to give you a sense of what we did, I'm just gonna pull out one gene instead of giving you the whole heat maps and all that jazz, one gene to kind of show you what that looks like. So the gene, uh, one of the genes that um, we know turns on always when estrogen is there is progesterone receptor in the hypothalamus, okay? Estrogen is there, progesterone receptor gene turns on. Okay, so we looked at estrogen receptor, uh, sorry, progesterone receptor gene in the hypothalamus. So what you can see here is the amount on the x-axis of this gene being turned on. And you can kind of just think of uh, the left axis, the y-axis here as like number of people, basically. Okay, and I want you to notice a couple of things here, right? 
If we had just ignored males and just did females, we would have been excluding the highest expressors of this gene, who arguably might be having the highest estradiol levels in the brain at least. <clears throat> and I want to point out that these are like massively overlapping, right? So, okay, we did this. And basically, the in a fancy array, what we did was we like drew a line. Okay, and we said, okay, everybody below this line is low estrogen, everything above this line is high estrogen. It's just a sense of what we did. Okay. And if you're interested in the results, it was not important for this talk. Um, it worked, <laughs> which is fun. So violin plots are really annoying to read because you want to look at this little line, this little gray line here, not the top of it. Okay. Look at where the body is. And we found what we expected, right? So when people had high estrogen, regardless of their assigned sex, according to the database, there was an increase of listening to the fat, but when um, people had low estrogen, they, these genes were, this brain region was listening to the stomach, they said, right? You can see that a little bit clearer here. We have a higher listening to adipose over here and a, a higher listening to stomach over here, okay? So, so, okay, we don't care about the results for this talk. <laughs> what we care about is that I had to go through, jump through a bunch of hoops and infer a physiology using a computer via, quite frankly, untested mechanism. We were not sure of that, right? And then we had to create a wholly new category in order to address our specific question. Um, and so this is where I want to bring in the idea of deconstructing sex could have just like helped us a lot in this scenario by moving from sex to sex variable. Um, and one of the ways we could do this is through, instead of using sex as a single variable, we move to multivariate frames. Throw away the category, think about what you're interested in in the category, and we have fancy computers now that can do all the math for us, like let's let them do it, right? Uh, I wanna point out that this is not, I'm not the first person to talk about this, right? Um, last year was a big year for this kind of work. Um, so, um, we had a paper come out about multivariate models of animal sex in ecology and evolution. Uh, after our paper, uh, and, oh, sorry, and then you can see, right, what happens, right? When we have this binary variable, we can do some fun stuff, but when we go to the traits that we're interested in and look at putting them into multivariate models, looking how they interact with each other, how they don't interact with each other, that's going to be a much more rich data set that will get us closer to the biological truth of what is happening as opposed to using an imperfect heuristic. Um, another paper came out, so this was right after actually um, our paper came out. Krisha Avi is one of my co-authors on our deconstructing sex paper. On the NAE, this is like a magnum focus on the sex diversity in the 21st century, where they also present, and I should say Krisha is a um, computational neuroscientist, so um, she, this is what she does. So she, she kind of expanded on what we'd already written about, um, if you're into interesting motor kind of looking schematics, um, the basic gist of this, right, is that we have various levels we can look at. So it's not just that we have all these different variables, but we can look from the population level to the behavior level, all the way down to ion channels and how they interact with these things um, in these multivariate frameworks. And we have the map to be able to do it. Um, they also have, if you're interested in flow charts, this is another way you can think about it, I'm not going to go over all of this, right? But the point being, right, we have from the study design all the way down to visualization and additional analyses, we can implement this multivariate solution in order to really understand the biology of what's happening as opposed to males and females are different, okay? So that's multivariate frameworks. Um, the problem with multivariate frameworks is that you need a lot of data <laughs> for that. So we're going to get the data from um, it takes a lot of money, and I would argue, and, and that's one of the things that's holding us back, right, is that like NIH budget hasn't really increased. What are we, how are we going to get all this data? I would argue that we should use things like sex as a biological variable, SABV, to advocate for funding for expanded data sets. So the person who kind of was the champion of SABV is Janine Clayton at the NIH, and even she says, SABV is not the same thing as looking for sex differences, even though that's how it's used, but it's about exploring the influences of sex as a biological variable and revealing the data hiding in plain sight. To me, 
This is the data that's hiding in plain sight that we don't have access to, not this, right? So we can use those words to advocate for more funding, for increased attention on expanding data sets like the GTEx database, like anybody who's trying to do a biobank, to collect variables that are interesting, not just check the box of male or female. Um, and the last thing for, to, to kind of round out moving from the category of sex to variables held within it is the idea of deproxying sex. <coughs> Excuse me, what do I mean about that? Well, the GTEx database used sex as a proxy. They told me male or female, but what they actually meant was Y chromosome presence. So let's just say, so instead of saying females, how are we defining females? Maybe you're defining females ovarian animal. And instead of saying females, maybe you're actually defining them as XX karyotype. Um, instead of saying males, maybe if it's in humans, you say self-reported men. You would not believe how many human research when they say like this many men, this many women, and the methods don't define how they've actually ass assessed sex and gender um, in, that, in that study, kind of mind-boggling. Um, and then maybe also thinking about instead of necessarily how you're defining it, what the actual variable of interest is. So um, maybe it's something that co-varies with our understanding of sex, for instance, like body composition. So one of the things that we do know is that when we assign people male and female, typically males have higher levels of visceral body fat and females have left higher levels of subcutaneous body fat. That is actually primarily due to uh, circulating gonadal hormones. Um, but anyway, so maybe instead of men, when you figured out that it's actually body composition that's driving your interesting phenomenon, we, we, just, we just say that, right? That we're actually looking at people with different body compositions because I know a lot of women that have high visceral body fat and I know a lot of men that have high subcutaneous body fat, right? And so if we're trying to apply these things appropriately, we need to know what we're applying and when. Um, so when you're thinking about deproxying sex, um, you need to think about what are you using sex as a proxy for and how are you defining sex? And I even want to push us even further, which is, okay, we, and let's say we're defining sex, let's say we're defining sex as karyotype, XX and XY. But are you then assuming internal consistency and saying that, oh, XX people have whatever, 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 and that's due to their estrogen level, right? So actually you're not defining, you might have originally defined sex as karyotype, but the variable of interest you're doing, you're actually looking at is the estrogen. Apologies for all the hormone references, as you know, I'm a hormone person. Okay, so that's kind of a, a quick brief rundown of, of that move from, from the category of sex to like actually the physiologies that we're interested in. Um, I want to bring back this little chart to, uh, to my own horn for just a little bit and uh, talk about an important third step that happened when we were dividing people into high and low estradiol, right? And that is that we did so, again, regardless of whether they were labeled as male or female, um, which was a problem for some of our reviewers. They were like, well, why are you looking at males? They don't, they don't have extra dial. Um, so that is to say, we pushed back and un tried to ungender extra dial, right? We were like, it doesn't matter who you are. We want to know if you have extra dial. I don't care whether you, who, how you identify what a scientist has told you you are. I can just look in your body and, and make an assumption based on, based on what I know about how estradiol works, okay? So we're gonna go into ungendering and recontextualizing now, okay? Which is an attempt to push back on sex and sex related variables being gender. Um, so the first step I think in ungendering and recontextualizing is pushing back against dimorphizing, which is what I talked about earlier when you have two categories and you separate them kind of superficially. So let's say you don't believe me, here's some data, okay? So in this study, um, they were looking at mice and humans trying, their, their main point was to kind of look at different relative ratios of hormones in mice and humans. Um, but what I would like to show you is that in female mice and premenopausal women, there are no zeros here. There's testosterone, there's estradiol, there's androstenedione, there's progesterone. And I would also like to point out that in both mice and premenopausal women, the amount of testosterone in the blood is higher than the amount of estradiol on average. So why don't we study testosterone in women? It's doing something. 
Some people might say, oh, so the biologists among us might know that testosterone is converted into estradiol. That's how you make estradiol. Some people might say, oh, 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 this is all converted into estradiol. Do you know that? We've never studied it. Maybe we should. Um, we can also do the same thing in males, right? We have young adult mice, gonadally intact, and, and they use old men for some reason here. Again, I want to point out that in the men, in the old men, there are no zeros. There's estradiol, no testosterone. The only, and I'm gonna put a put the caveat here that there are below detectable limits in the mice, but that also is just because they're small and don't have a lot of blood. Um, so I'm sure if you could get a lot of mice together and, and pool them, you would you would detect some. Okay. Um, so let's say you're like, okay, you convinced me with hormones, but like my little girl definitely learned to talk more before my little boy did, right? There's there must be sex and gender differences that are dimorphic in human behavior. Well, one of the biggest um, non-reproductive related sex differences in humans is height. Everybody agrees men tend to be taller than women. This is the distribution of height generally in the United States of America, okay? Inches on the bottom, number of people about on the, on the, on the y-axis, okay? Men, women, okay? If you have someone who is five feet, probably gonna be a woman, okay? Probably, not all, probably. If you have someone who's like uh, me, so, so five foot seven, you know, probably equal men and women. We have some overlap, okay? The point I want to make here, right, is that this D, this is Cohen's D, so this is the amount of overlap between two distributions, um, and Cohen's D here is two. This is the, the like I said, the largest thing you can see. What about um, cognitive sex and gender differences? The largest cognitive sex and gender difference to date um, that we have consistently found is mental rotation tasks. So mental rotation tasks, boys and men tend to be better than women and girls. If I transform height to have the same Cohen's D as mental distribution, mental rotation tasks, this is what it would look like. Does that look like two separate boxes to you? Right? Granted, right? There are a lot of people like in the little outliers here, right? But we prematurely dimorphize this trait and other traits. And this is the largest sex difference, gender difference. Like mental rotation. So you can um Anybody take organic chemistry? Organic chemistry. Okay. So I'll think of another example. Um, so if you if I give you a shape and, and I give you a shape in one orientation, a 3D shape and a shape in another orientation, you need to tell me if they match, and then you're gonna in your head have to like turn it to see if it matches. Yeah. So it, it's something that actually is, is really difficult if you can't for chemistry. So we have something called chirality and if you can't turn the molecule in your head, you'll never, you'll never know. You'll just never know. Um, so yeah, so it, it's this, yeah. Yeah, so this is the biggest one, right? So everything else has more overlap than this, right? In terms of behavior and, and cognitive behavior. Um, so, so to me, this is pretty good evidence that we should start de-demorphizing and start living in the gray a little more. I know scientists, we love, to truncate and it's important to simplify for our scientific method. I get it, I've done science, I know when things are messy, it's confusing. But at this point, I think we have that capacity. We can stand on the data that we have and complicate it a little bit more. So the other thing I wanna talk about, or two more things, sorry, I'm running a little bit long today, um, is uh, removing gendering and sexing of our physiologies. Um, so this is very similar, so I can breeze through this a little bit, um, to what I had said previously in, in, in the sex to sex variable section. Um, some of my friends published in, in, in uh, Science a little short perspective of transgender rights uh, rely on inclusive language, and their main argument was the same as mine, right, which is instead of saying male chromosomes, we say what we mean, sex karyotypes, right, instead of female behavior, so I know there's a sexuality people here, um, so instead of like female behavior and mites, Mice, we might say lordosis, which is the female sexual behavior, um, which is something that all mice do, not just females, right? So when we restrict ourselves to studying female lordosis, we're actually ignoring lordosis in other animals that we don't think are as female and are in a different context. What does make a male mouse lordose? When I was taught it, I was taught they couldn't lordose. And then I looked at the actual data and I was like, oh no, everybody's mounting, everybody's lordosing, just at different levels, right? 
Um, instead of women of reproductive age, we should say what we mean. Do you know how many studies I've tried to sign up for um, that I don't qualify as a woman of reproductive age, even though most scientists would tell me I was, because I'm on hormonal birth control? And they exclude a lot of people on birth control unless they are um, unless they are studying birth control, right? So if you're like, I, I'm still a woman of reproductive age according to science. So, so you know, maybe actually talk about what you actually want. People with naturally cycling menstrual cycles. Um, we can also get into politically charged terms like mothers. We're talking about when we talk about mothers, are we talking about pregnant people, which could include actively pregnant people, which could include trans folks? Um, are we talking about people who are postpartum, which could also include people who have unfortunately miscarried? Or are we talking about people who have carried a child to term and then currently have living dependents? Because if you include, if this is what you want, and then you call them mothers, now you're telling adopted people that they don't have mothers, right? So, so we can we can do this till the cows come home, right? Um, same thing with before, right? Uh, of the GTEx database instead of sex, we say Y chromosome, right? We say what we need, okay? Um, the more fun one that I want to talk about today, and this is the last thing I promise, um, is resisting social scripts in our science. So um, some of you might have read Emily Martin's um, pun intended seminal work. Um, about the egg and the sperm in uh, 1991, where she expertly looks at biology textbooks and looks at the narratives around what we tell on repro the narratives we tell about reproduction. And so one of the popular narratives that we tell about reproduction is we have a, an egg just like sitting there in the castle, waiting for the sperm to fight their way through the horrible reproductive tract. And then the egg has a catcher's mitt and she catches the sperm and fertilization happens, right? Um, now we're all laughing, okay? But there is a gene known as ZP3, okay? It's on the egg, and we call it the sperm receptor. Now in biology, we use a lot of metaphors. And so a receptor we tend to think about as a lock, and the ligand we tend to think of as the key. Mm -hmm. So if the egg has the lock and the sperm has the key, now we're in heteronormativity, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if any other children of the 90s remember the horrible, like a lock unlocks a lot of keys or whatever, you know, that whole thing. So, so we have, we have these social scripts, right? Um, but are they real? So ZP3 is a glycoprotein. And the structure of a glycoprotein probably actually means that it's the ligand, it's the key. The egg has the key, okay? Which would mean that the sperm has the lock, but that doesn't fit our social scripts, right? Um, and so this, one of these papers that I just found, you know, is trying to draw attention to that, right? And one way we can resist social scripts is actually saying what things are, making sure they don't align with our social scripts, but just really thinking about what they are, right? That the sperm has the receptor, right? The sperm has the receptor, okay? Um, but I actually want to push us even further. Let's read the rest of this part of the this paper. I didn't highlight it up. Um, accumulated evidence suggests but the sperm ZP receptor is a dynamic multi-molecular structure requiring coordinated action of different proteins that are assembled into a functional complex during post-testicular maturation and processing. Okay, whatever. Let's talk about the part I want you to focus on. A dynamic multi-molecular structure requiring coordinated action. So what if it's not a lock and a key at all? What if it's just a bunch of proteins that like come together mutually to facilitate fertilization, right? Resisting social scripts doesn't mean flipping them. It also means dismantling them, just like I'm advocating for dismantling sex, right? And we can see this not only, so this is an example of how our social scripts impact what we are, um, how we interpret the data we have, um, but it also impacts the questions we ask, right? So um, male aggression, aggression is male. If I do a quick PubMed search, Right? We have male aggression is much more studied than female aggression because aggression is male. Um, but if we tap into the maternal mama bear um, uh, trope, we, we, we do get an increase here. Right? So, so we are missing out on studying things that could illuminate how things work because we're like intellectually and creatively stunted by these social scripts. And none, I think, helps that uh, elucidate that more 
in the idea that testosterone equals aggression. Um, and if it wasn't for Aubrey Kelly, um, who's a friend of mine at Emory, um, showing that testosterone actually increases pro-social behavior too, not just antisocial aggression, but pro-social behavior as well. If we undecouple our gendered and sexed ideas from physiologies, um, we can ask more expansive questions, get closer to the truth, um, and expand the directions of our field in ways that we currently don't even see because of our social perspectives. Um, so that kind of sums up the end of ungendering and recontextualizing. So just a quick little sum up slide. And then I, I'm sorry for taking so long, but I hope to field any questions you might have. There are a lot of different other ways we can deconstruct sex, but these are my two favorite ways that I wanted to present to you today. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions or field any comments you may have. So thank you all very much. I am not speaking. I have this good music. Do you have any questions? <laughs> um, I just had a question about um, hormone production versus hormone sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Because something that I've talked about with anthropology students on some occasions when it can arise is um, the difference between human and chimpanzee mm -hmm. production and sensitivity, or they both change. Mm -hmm. It's not just that we produce less testosterone than chimpanzee do. Um, I noticed in a lot of your discussion, um, production was sort of the, the, the focus, right? Yeah. But um, I thought it was interesting when I was, when I was thinking about sort of deconstructing and then rebuilding the narratives that mm -hmm. help us to figure out what we want to study or how to interpret things. Mm -hmm. um, that also falls into that yeah, sort of like production is this yeah, yes. <laughs> production is this kind of like active, uh -huh. you know, powerful force and mm -hmm. receiving something is clearly, yeah. you know, not. Um, so I just thought that that was really interesting, just kind of immediately yeah. um, in real time applying your perspective was really helpful. So I, I love appreciate that. that. Yeah, it's not really a question. That's <laughs> I said comments. Some, you know, said comments. <laughs> if you could kind of like maybe remind us a little bit about the different ways that sensitivity to yeah. hormones is maybe equally variable, or maybe it's not equally variable. It is, yeah. So, so one of my favorite examples of that. Thank you for that. That's amazing. I hadn't thought about that before. That's why I love teaching and giving talks and learning things. I love it. Um, so, so one of my favorite examples of sensitivity changing. Um, when production maybe might not or, or is restored is the idea of, um, if anybody has ever had anyone go through menopause, um, most OBGYNs and doctors will say you need to get on estradiol or placement therapy quickly, right? You can't wait until you're like kind of in menopause in order to get onto it. And the reason for that is actually if you start immediately before all your estradiol decrease, it will just, the, the exogenous estradiol will just take over and it will be great, all is dandy. It will help with a lot of different symptoms, yada, yada, yada. If you wait and your estradiol is depleted for too long, um, we, there is a mechanism in the hypothalamus that changes how much estrogen receptor is there and what it's doing. So that when the estrogen comes back in and the brain is like, oh shit, gotta get the estrogen receptor there, it actually has negative effects now and it no longer rescues the positive effects, right? So it's, it's, again, this active process of receptor regulation and the response of the receptor, so it's not even sensitivity, it, sensitivity is it too, but also the response of the receptor can change based on context, based on the secondary cascades that are happening in the cell as well. So yeah, absolutely, uh, I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. I saw a lot of it. Um, one thing that you mentioned um, that I found really interesting, and I would like to potentially elaborate more on, or maybe provide an example of, you mentioned that, um, as I understood it, gendered experiences can actually uh, inform or affect like physical 
sex based mm -hmm. characteristics in the body. And I was just like, that would be a lot of work on that. Yeah, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll bring up just so we know whose work I'm citing um, eventually when it figures itself out. Um, all right, so that's going to be Sarah Van Anders' work, right? Um, and I don't quite remember what she did exactly, like what the gendered experience was. She did a couple of them, right? Um, I measured just testosterone before and after saw that like various gendered experiences of either being gender affirming or gender non-affirming or a, a, a experience associated with the gender that you identify with um, can affect testosterone, for instance, in different ways. Um, so that Sarah Van Andrews' work. We can also talk about like old work, like Robert Sapolsky's work, where, um, you know, the, the maybe not gendered, but gendered experience of becoming a father can also change testosterone. I'm a testosterone. I should have also mentioned that testosterone was like what I was in before I moved temporarily estradiol. So those are most of my examples, right? Um, but another one you can think of, right, um, is a little bit more superficial, right? Um, but thinking about um, hirsutism is something that I've been thinking about recently. So hirsutism is, um, by definition, unwanted body hair growth. I'm going to point out the unwanted part, right? <laughs> Um, because the part of hirsutism that requires treatment is not the body hair, um, it is the stress that comes along with it, right? And so when the stress that comes along with it, now you have high glucocorticoids in your system, and glucocorticoids can act, act on both um, androgen and glucocorticoid receptors, right? So now you have all the receptor sensitivity is being affected by something that's a not sex variable, but it's having a sex approach to it, right? So, so those are just kind of some loose examples of how these things can happen. You can also think of, um, there are a couple of my friends in the field that are trying to develop uh, minority stress models in animals, right? You can think of those as gendered and racialized experiences as well, right? That will affect physiologies, including those that we associate with sex. That answer the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, uh, so I just want to say, like, I'm sure you noticed this as well, um, but I wanted to thank you for, like, highlighting that more precise language um, also leads to more inclusive language as well. It ends up being kind of, like, one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to thank you, like, as a trans person for highlighting that. Happy to also um, share that with you. Shout out, you know, the, the science article. Um, which was written by all trans trans women. Um, the where are we? Transgender rights, non inclusive language. Um, Mayor Miyagi, I don't know where she is now, but Earth of May is at um, Princeton right now, and Simone is in Just Women's Lab at uh, Close Point Harbor. So feel free to look up their work as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So a lot of the articles that you've referenced are relatively current. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so biology, science, medicine is just coming to this place of looking at more nuance, more complexity. Kicking and screaming, yes. Right. <laughs> so when are we going to see this ripple out, right, to affect policy or to affect gendered scripts? You know, like, what, is, what do you feel is, like, the impact? The millennial in me says never. Um, <laughs> you know, the, we're all going to die anyway, right? So, um, but, um, you know, even though it feels very recent, it feels very forceful. It's like, it feels like a wave, right? Um, that seems to be happening, at least in my field, right? Um, in conferences like the Society for Behavior and Neuroendocrinology, which I'm a part of, or the Organization for the Society of Sex Differences, these topics have been consistent topics for, I want to say, at least the last four to five years, right? So in, at a uh, Society for Behavior and Neuroscience in what year is it? So 2022, you know, we had a, a trans health and hormones panel I helped run at, at SVN. Um, and so, you know, I do want to point out though that I purposefully picked recent articles. Like the, the field of science and technology studies has been saying all this for like eons, right? Like Ruth Hubbard was writing about this in the 90s. Um, you know, 
like I said, Thomas Lack, like all of this, this all also was happening earlier, just not necessarily as adjacent to science, right? And so now I do think we have these bridge people, myself included, maybe. Um, that was, that my, is, that was kind of my follow up question. Yeah. Like, who's doing the science and what right. kind of science do they care about? Right. So does it matter who goes into science, how, who we're recruiting in our classes, right? Right. We're supporting these other graduate school mm -hmm. so that they can do this kind of science. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, like I said, I think that the people who are talking about this tend to be the endocrinologists, the neuroendocrinologists, the endocrinologists in general. I mean, I could list off the people doing this work in the lab, right? So right now I'm not, I have to just, full disclosure, I'm not in the lab anymore, right? I have a teaching position. Um, sorry, biologists, but I'm very happy to be out of the lab, to be quite honest. I love, um, right? But, um, you know, uh, we could talk about, you know, uh, Troy Rupke is a, um, a biologist at, a neuro, neuroendocrinologist at Rutgers, um, and they've been doing this work for forever, you know, they're tenured, right, and everything like that. Um, and so I think, I think we just have a groundswell now, um, and I do think it depends, I don't necessarily, I want to be clear with, obviously it depends on who we're supporting and who we're training, but I also think it depends on how we're training people. Right. Mm -hmm. When I teach my students, regardless of their identities, right? Um, my favorite question I got last semester was like, um, uh, why, why, or what was it? Why are why are we doing surgeries on intersex people if if they don't want it? Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would also like to say, full disclosure, that the medical establishment doesn't call them intersex, we call them disorders of sexual development. Right, but I am I'm priming you to like use the language people want to use about themselves, right? Um, and that helps that frame shift as well, regardless of their identities, right? And so obviously, I think um, the people that come into science, and you know, it to me makes complete sense that the place with the most trans people in neuroscience is going to be neuroendocrinology, right? Like. Uh, May's, May's whole shtick is that she wants to get a lab and study gender affirming hormone therapy and what it does to the brain, right? It makes sense, right? And so these are obviously the fields that are going to be the vanguards. Um, but I think, you know, a rising tide um, as it rises all ships or something like that, right? Like I think, I think we can, if it's, if we change our language as we're teaching, as we're training, um, I think we can, we can sneak our way in, you know? Yeah, I just wonder when that's happening in relationship to other legislation that's also happening. Not soon enough, right? right. Yeah. Very slow skill gate. Yeah. Very yeah, not soon enough. enough. You know, you know, my hope, and this might be naive, but my hope is that um the legislation is like the Twitter trolls, mm -hmm. and that eventually they'll lose focus and they'll go on to the next target um before they do too much damage, right? Like that's the naive hope. Especially given, right, like any, I want to point out, any anti-trans and any anti-intersex bills, one is too many, okay? One is too many. At the same time, we can also appreciate the 500 to 85, in a way. And I'm not saying, like, one is too many, one is too many. But we can also appreciate that a lot of these are what I hope is disregarded a lot of the time. Um, you should have, some of the ones I read were like high sentences law, right? Obviously they weren't gonna get passed, people were just doing it as a way to be like, look what I did to my constituents, right? Um, yeah, it's not happening soon enough, um, but I think, I think there are enough of us at like, different levels of academia that if they, they need an expert witness, they got them. just a matter of calling this in. Um, Megan, I see a question in the chat box mm -hmm. from Jake Glazier. So there are actually two questions. I wonder what Dr. Massa would think, thinks about the importance of science setting the standard in language mm -hmm. and metaphors mm -hmm. for broader social change. Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Can we stop there because I'm not good at help memory. Um, uh, yes, the answer to that question is yes, right? I think that Scientists, I mean, listen, sometimes you say something and then it gets reported and they say something different because they're trying to help translate and that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, but I do think we as scientists need to be cognizant of how we use metaphors 
in our own explanations. And that can help lead the way for science communication and the way we talk about things, right? And it's my reason primarily actually for advocating for the stop using male and female sex categories, right? Because if we keep using them, we keep giving legitimacy to them, right? We do have a system to work within. I understand that, right? But we can, if we, if we start neglecting the category in favor of what we're actually studying, we can delegitimize like my other favorite, I got attacked on Twitter and my favorite one was like, oh, you use male and female in this paper. Like, yes, I do. I have a system to work within, but I want you to look at how I'm defining that. And I want you to look at what I'm doing to dismantle that. I'm treating female mice with testosterone. Right? Like, what are you? What is, who are you, Twitter troll? Right? You know what I mean? So, so yeah. Sorry, continue. Next question. Okay. So, oops. the next question is why has this change been so challenging for science? Mm -hmm. It's a million dollar question, right? Um, I think there's just, there's a lot of reasons. I think that, um, So, so scientists like clean experiments, right? That's one of the reasons, right? Um, we like to simplify, right? When I was, my favorite scenario in college was I was in physics and my professor drew a dot on the board and he goes, this is a box. He goes, this is a box, but I'm only drawing the center of gravity because that's all we care about, right? Nevertheless, the box experiences friction in a different way than the center of gravity does and air resistance and things like that. Um, and scientists do that. We use heuristics. It's important. Otherwise, there's just too much for us to figure out, right? We need to simplify things. Um, it's just how we simplify them and when, whether we need to question whether their heuristic has outlived its usefulness seems to be a conversation that people aren't willing to have for multiple reasons, men, one of which is it's harder to get papers out quicker. We need the papers for tenure. Um, we don't get grants if we don't have public, right? Like there's like the, the whole system is promoting quick, easy, flamboyant science, sex difference, like sexy time, right? Um, so I think that that's a big component of it. Um, I also think there's a little bit of like, um, well, if we disregard this category we've used for so long, what do we do with all this other research that uses it? Um, and to that, I say, thank you for that research, because without it, we couldn't build upon it and deconstruct it, right? You couldn't expand upon it. Um, but there are definitely a lot of people who think that we're like dismantling their legacies. And, and, and so. Corey, didn't you have an issue with this too about how you have to use certain terms to publish? Because you're like the research is based on people using those terms. Like, oh, it's something that particularly in, in physical anthropology is is fighting forensics. Yeah. Um, in general, yeah, like mm -hmm. all over the place, you, you're you're deciding between constantly whether it's teaching or if it's outreach or you know if you're trying to, um, especially when transferring knowledge, you're deciding how much of the complicated stuff nobody cares about you say. Mm -hmm. So that's always the case. And then in, in, in certain areas, it's, it's very difficult because in, in biological anthropology, we're busily deconstructing a lot of the assumptions about um, morphology of the skeleton or the skull specifically and how it relates or doesn't relate to current conceptualizations of racial categories that we use as a, as a politic and especially as law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so if you need somebody to go find a woman, quick, she's missing, help her. Um, then there's an agreed upon system that those law enforcement are using to go and knock, door knock and witnesses use certain terms and they won't understand if you don't. And so you get into this sort of situation of, you, of, of choosing um, by what objectives am I curtailing the words and narratives that I'm using? Because when you have, a, I think in certain cases, like I think your, your specific example of your research is a really critical example. It's really awesome because I think it's in <laughs> too often times, I feel like whenever in, you know, research in biological anthropology, um, you know, we, we might be talking about robusticity and bone and then the natural thing for people to want to know about 
and I'm sure in air quotes, is um, do men and women have different activity levels in this population over centuries? Or did it change after um, they, the economic shifts in that region or things like this? That, th those are the questions that, um, that people are asking you. And then you say, you know, well, you know, I didn't ask them what their gender and sexuality is. And I don't have this video. I don't have, you know, all the, all the genes mapped out and I can't dial in. Um, but I find myself, you know, finding new ways to talk about my own research in my head as we're having this you know, sort of experience together. And I think, I think you pointed out the like real problem and what I kind of touched on in the beginning, which is that like, we like to think science as this objective. We're looking at what's actually happening in the biology, but we're curtailed by the society we live in and, and the way that we refer to things and the social contracts that we've made about certain terms, right? Um, so yeah, it's real frustrating. Sorry, good luck. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'll be the book, the, the, the dissenting voice uh, in which I think the university is a great place for that. Mm -hmm. Respectful disagreement. I disagree with your thesis overall. I, I do believe that sex is an important category mm -hmm. and that we shouldn't ignore it. Uh, to our, you asked us a question earlier. You said you gave us uh, the thing about shape rotation. You said, do these look like two different groups to you? Mm -hmm. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're statistically significantly different. Mm. And so I don't I don't think it'd be wise for us to throw out the baby with the bath portion. So I guess I guess my response to that, right, is um, you know, my point is deconstructing sex as a category, not throwing out everything in the box of sex, right? Um, so I appreciate your point. And I also want to kind of push back a little on the idea of clinical versus statistical significance, right? Um, so the idea, so one of my favorite exercises with my students is I put up some uh, statistically significant data on like the effect of um, a certain, um, is it birth control? I think it is, it's a, a certain birth control on um, depression scores, right? And there is a statistically significant increase in, just in depression scores, right? Um, but then if you actually look at the scores, they're all still within the moderate depression. Right. So this idea of like clinical versus statistical significance is also something that I like to think about a lot of like, you know, statistical significance is a necessary, I would agree 100% it's a necessary thing that we need to do in order to determine if our results are real or if they're spurious. But I think we have to go even a step further from that and be like, okay, so this isn't happening by chance, but do I care? <laughs> yeah, know? I know you don't care, but lots of us yeah. do. It's a meaningful biological category. It evolved for a reason. And you have a couple of, you, you treat them like they were smoking guns. Mm -hmm. Look at the hormonal variation. And there's not a clear mm -hmm. difference between men and women. But I, I thought your smoking guns actually demonstrated that there are indeed differences between men and women, males and females. Yeah, it's interesting. So I would, I would definitely, um, you know, my pushback is like, you know, you said that it, it evolved, right? These categories evolved. Um, I would agree with you that gametes evolved, but the sexes didn't evolve. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the framework that um, Thomas Laffer, that I referenced a little bit, um, has put forward. So if you look at old manuscripts from the, I'm really bad with years. So I want to say 17, 1800s, early 1800s. Um, the manuscripts there, um, and Thomas Locker argues, I highly recommend you look at his book, um, Making Sex, um, argues that at that point, sex was viewed as a spectrum. So for instance, like um, ovaries were known as male testes, right? And the um, vaginal canal was an inverted penis, right? So the words we used for the same structures we had were on a continuum from maleness to femaleness, still placing maleness higher, but it was viewed as females were like a, a smaller version of the same male sex, right? right? Sex is a Right, but so, so we have this, right? And then from that, there's a switch 
in the later 1800s, again, don't quote me on the dates, where we start viewing sex now as two distinct categories. And I think that to me, that history is very indicative of the fact that we are actively looking at what's real. We are looking at the real physiologies and in our attempt to make sense of them, we are creating categories that change over time. And that's not to say that the categories all haven't been useful and that they haven't been um, important for our social and scientific structure. But I think personally, and like you said, the academy is a place to disagree. Personally, as a scientist, we'll get to the slide, give me a second. Um, I'm trying to think about what's the best slide. But personally, as a scientist, they've outlived, they outlived their usefulness because they have stopped me from doing my job easily, right? So, so I want to say that I hear you, right? And I have gotten, if anybody is in biology and knows Art Arnold, the father of modern neurotechnology research, he's, he's one of my mentors. He and I get into fights of this all the time, right? Um, and I'm not saying that sex hasn't been a useful category. It's just something that nowadays, I think we need to be cognizant of the fact of how it's being used and that it is impacting both our science and our society, possibly <laughs> negatively. Um, and so even just talking about it and thinking about it, to me, I'm happy just to talk about it with you, you know, even if I don't convince you, that's fine. Also in England, they have my own final comment. Yeah, yeah. That anti, you described anti-transgender legislation. Yeah. A lot of that is stuff like keeping males out of women's sports. People like me support that. Actually, most people don't want males in women's sports. We're not anti-trans. So I would argue that that statement is anti-trans because we, you know, we have different understandings of what male and female are, right? And to me, male and female are gendered terms as well. So, 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 um, you know, saying you want males out of female sports. Um, I would also like to ask you if you know the history of why women's sports exists. Um, and the answer is actually because uh, women started beating men and they were like, we can't have that. Let's make a separate thing. And, and then that, that is, the, the, you know, you can look up the history. You don't have to believe me. Um, that's great. You can look up the history. I have the citations to back it up. It's fine. Um, so, yeah. So, anyway. So, this, so that's the difference between someone considering a, a coach and someone and it's just for clarity. We have yeah. a difference in perspective for people who we consider a, a trans female not female. So, so there, yeah, there are people who would consider trans women not female. And so they can't do and so they can't female. do go to play in female sports. Right. Correct. Um, or trans men. Right, and the same thing, right? So men and they can't do male. Correct. That's not an issue. That's that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Right. So so that's interesting to me that that's not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, well, is, yeah. <laughs> if we let males compete in women's, uh, this is kind of this is right because that's, that's a sexist way. assumption, right? That like we can let uh, women compete in men's sports uh, uh, under your paradigm, but not men compete in women's sports, right? Like why do we protect one class and not the other? And it's because it rests on the assumption that women are inherently worse at sports. Um, so yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I encourage this kind of discussion, but I don't know that that's the focus of this talk. Today. I agree, yeah. And and so I, I think you're fond of derailing conversations to these ends. And so if you want to engage in the conversation today, like let's do that over this talk. Um, and we're running out of time. So does anybody else have questions for our speaker? Yeah. Just check the chat. I didn't see anything. Yeah. Like two questions. So, so um, I was wondering if you don't mind. I know that this is probably going to be online, right? So we can yes, find some quick. But do you mind going to the slide in the beginning about the different sort of um, perspectives? I I don't know about calling them paradigms, but I, in one of them there was like a specific um, framing about sort of starting with sex um, as you know, sort of just two flavors. Mm -hmm. like you might think of ice cream as having two flavors or mm -hmm. something. Um, and then the second that you need to dial in on any one given aspect about mm -hmm. a person, mm -hmm. um, that dichotomy has to define itself as useful, has to prove itself useful. 
And so I think that um, for anybody who finds himself <laughs> easily um, concerned about a perspective like this being a claim that sex isn't important, um, I think that's a, that by itself isn't an accurate um, uh, depiction of what sort of we are and should be moving towards. It is that we find things about one another um, in our sexuality, in our sexual differences. And as we do, we're better able to understand them the second that we stop using a dichotomy that doesn't do it justice. Right. I think you demonstrated a case of a, of a study that doesn't, isn't done justice by a dichotomy. Yeah. And so I think that the number of cases that wouldn't be done justice by a dichotomy is surprisingly large if we start um, using that. And so I don't think it's fair to characterize it um, as not important. I think, you know, we all start with a certain framing, like you said, a heuristic. Mm -hmm. There's a heuristic for a reason. Yeah, it's important. Um, we don't need to die, we need to die by them. Right. You know, literally. Yeah, I'd also like to reference, and if you're interested in something similar to that, um, Herb de Vries has done a lot of interesting work on um, what is called the compensation mechanism. So um, his framework has been um, that sex differences can work toward different behaviors or they can work towards the same behavior. Um, and so that's another time where using the heuristic of the dichotomy hides the physiological differences that are happening to like the, uh, what his, his, his work is on prairie voles and um, oxytocin based suppressant and sexual behavior. And so he's found that female prairie voles and male prairie voles use different systems to get to the same solution. Um, but if we were just looking at the, the behavior and looking at sex differences, we wouldn't have dug deeper, right? Because there wouldn't have been a sex difference of behavior. So what's the point, right? So I think that's kind of another example of what, of what you were talking about. So here's a question. Yeah, very, very, very briefly. Um, so I'll try just to um, share this comment. Um, yeah. Thing. And that also is uh, kind of following on what we were discussing before about uh, how and to what extent sex uh, has been making justice of scientific reality of human mm -hmm. beings. Let's, mm -hmm. let's just think about our human beings. So I think that also another very important concept that you talked about is also this assumption of internal consistency mm -hmm. that you mentioned before. Because if I if I am to speak personally as I will, I would say that as a cisgender person, yes, my sexual and my gender identity does matter to me. And that's why, that's precisely why. I'm um, wondering, for instance, when you mentioned that you have not been able to uh, be considered into the category of women because you were on reproductive control. Mm -hmm. So to what extent sex as a category, as a biological, and I'm also just adding something on the psychological side, mm -hmm. is making justice of all women and all mm -hmm. even cis women that usually think that they are part of the category of women. Mm -hmm. So how is even sex being used and, and making justice to one side mm -hmm. of the dichotomy yep. itself? And I wanted also to uh, ask you this, because I also mm, I had the opportunity to read one of your uh, latest publications. And what you also mentioned today, and you um, repeated this very important concept, are we biologists, especially neuroendocrinologists, um, what are we doing in our research in terms of uh, describing, trying, cause, trying to find cause and effect uh, in, between different variables, or are we applying gender assumption to mm -hmm. read any kind of differences that we might find? Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you this. Do you think that, first of all, is um, would ever be possible to mm -hmm. gender separate mm -hmm. what we call gender and sex 
in this case, mm -hmm. and how we differentiate because uh, me and I think also a colleague here that is uh, teach psychology of gender. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that we discuss with our students are the differences not only between sex and gender, but sex, gender, and gender identity. So the category of gender is usually considered to be the social constructionism right. of what we see as mm -hmm. actually what pertains to sex, mm -hmm. whereas gender identity is how usually is a more, the more individual mm -hmm. part of the phenomenon, how, how every one of us does it, um, uh, every one of us identifies mm -hmm. with. Yeah. So first of all, what do you think about this? Yeah. Is it, uh, does any any way that we can sharply differentiate in our interpretation, even though I saw that you were trying not to actually erase yeah. even the category itself, yeah. the interpreter, but to broaden them up differently? Yeah, so I wanted to, your question, I wanted to shout out. So um, starting in like, I want to say the early 2000s, a lot of STS folks started using the term sex slash gender. Um, yes. in order to kind of get at that point that you're saying, right, that is it even possible to, at least in humans, disentangle these two things, right? Um, I want to shout out that uh, Sari Van Anders switches those terms and uses gender sex um, because of um, making the argument that actually, no, it's never going, our, and it's kind of, again, goes back to that Thomas Locker argument, our creation of the categories of sex are inherently gendered. So how can we ungender them, right? And I think that's kind of why, um, I think that's kind of the main impetus behind my idea of like, okay, throw away the category, don't throw away what's in the category, um, but that still leaves the problem that the things in the category still have this the kind of all meshed up together. Um, and so the cynic in me is gonna test say, no, I actually don't think we're ever able, because you know, I tell all my students um, my first day of class, I say, anybody, any scientists, any non-scientist, any professor gets up in front of you and says that they are unbiased. They're lying to themselves, lying to you, and trying to sell you something, right? No one is unbiased. Even computers are not unbiased because we create them, right? And so, so that part of me is like, we're never going to be free of it. We're never going to be free of any of these biases that are so ingrained. They may shift. They may change. Um, but I think that's I think what's both beautiful and horrible about being human. And like, we can just do our best and we're going to fuck up and we're going to keep trying and that's all, that's all we can do, you know? So I don't know if that was an answer, but I, I, I hate to say it, but I think the answer is no. Like, I think, I think we just got to keep, keep trucking along and keep trying. Um, you know, I, oh, Oops. yes, there is a question in the chat box. Um, let's see, where is it from? I think Pluto Young. Yeah, I see. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So they're asking about um where you can find my work and hear the. So I think you will submit the recording. Yes. Everybody. Um. But um. So I mean, pub 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 me. Um. I have I have a bunch of articles um, out. Um, I will say that my main stuff on this is the the one article deconstructing sex. I hope to have more things in the future, but. You know, I'm still a young career person, so give me some time to grow. Um, I also, you know, I'll give a plug. Um, I had a fun conversation on a podcast, like a, a no-name little podcast called uh, When a Guy Has. Um, and it was really fun. You can hear me talk to Jolene. Um, so I'll plug that one as well. Um, it's long and it's rambling. Fair warning. Um, I did warn her that I'm a professor, so I'll just keep talking. So. She did not perform. I think that's about it in the chat box. Um, for the recording, I'm going to once it, it's going to be a long recording, you must understand. So Zoom, once it processes it, I will get an email notification and I'll share the link with uh, the respective professors and who can share the link with their students. That's the best way. I think. And of course, if you want the link, I'm going to share it with you, Megan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's give a hand. Give a hand to Megan.
And as minor thing, I would like to state in my introduction, you know, I thanked Betsy, okay? But I didn't state her affiliation if you don't happen to know that. She's a professor, <laughs> is a, a professor of uh, Spanish. And guess what? Also the campus chief diversity officer. Thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really do appreciate about this uh, meeting today is that it's interdisciplinary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have never done this before. Bringing lots of diverse yeah. approaches. And so, like, I would love to see more. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bonsai. Thank you. Thank you, the audience, for showing up at 3 p.m. on Friday. Yes. So, our next.